Uh, do that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am Onamik, Onamik Saha. I'm a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths University of London, and I'm also the co-convener there of the MA in Race, Media and Social Justice. It's a real pleasure to have you join us for this workshop. Um, I'm guessing that nearly all of you were probably in the session previous to this. Um, so I'm really, really grateful um, for you to for sticking around and for um, engaging with this workshop, which um, we have, it's gonna be led by two brilliant, brilliant people who I'm gonna introduce shortly. Um, I'm gonna do my intro, which is gonna repeat a lot of what I, well, basically repeat the introduction from the earlier um, session um, for those, for any of you who may not have been there, but um, essentially this is session four of the Building the Fugitive Academy Conference that is entitled for Labour of Inclusion, Diversity, Access and Equity. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, I want to thank our numerous sponsors who've made this conference free for everyone to attend and participate in. I'm not going to list them all because it's a very long list, but if you go to the Building the Fugitive Academy website, which when I'm organised enough, I will post in the chat, um, you can see the list of um, sponsors. Um, so the aim of the conference as laid out on our website is to facilitate coalition building and community support in order to ease the burden of doing inclusion, diversity, equity and access work in our institutions and professional organisations. And with this session and this workshop on the labour of inclusion, diversity, access and equity, we get to the core of what the conference is trying to achieve. So with this workshop, we want to provide some practical outputs related to doing IDA, idea work, EDI work, whatever you want to call it, including creating space, recreating policy and sustaining change. Um, to lead this workshop, as I said, we have two amazing speakers and practitioners who come with a wealth of experience, expertise and insights regarding doing the labour of EDI work in academia. I won't list all of their wonderful achievements and accolades as this would eat into precious time. So if it's okay, I'm just gonna introduce them by their titles only, but do look them up on our website so you can see their detailed biographies. We have Relina Joseph, who is the Associate Dean of Equity and Justice in Graduate Programs and Professor of Communication and Founding and Acting Director of the Center for Communication, Difference and Equity. And Relina, I have unforgivably left out the name of your institution in my introduction. Relina, could you just say hello? And, <laughs> Tell us where you where you're based. At again. University of Washington that's, well, in that's Seattle. Right, that's All right, Seattle. good. Yeah, All yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Sorry, I have mama. too many jobs. That's it. I have too many jobs. <laughs> um, Six of the time. And we've also got Krista Olson, who's Associate Professor of Composition and Rhetoric at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, for those of you just joined us, I should say that this session is recorded. So it was being recorded. So you just saw my embarrassing um, gaff in front of Relina. That's for everyone to see across time and space. Um, but yeah, do bear that in mind. Um, I'll leave it to Alina and Krista to, to, to describe the format of the session. But as I said, the, the emphasis is on producing some practical tools that can help you all with doing this kind of work in your institutions and organizations. Um, the chat box is open. If you look at it, Krista has actually asked you to introduce yourselves. This is a workshop. So we do wanna keep this fairly informal or at least very interactive. So do do that. If you've got any questions uh, for the speakers, please do post them in the chat and they will address them. Um, as, as, as necessary. Um, and we also have a Discord channel, which I'm gonna, I'll put up a link to that shortly. Um, so yes, so um, I should actually also, it's very important for me to um, start, well, I'm just putting up my notes here, um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, so though we're not gathering in a physical space today, the organizing committee recognizes the histories of settler colonialism that pervade the places we live and work. For many of you joining from North American universities, every one of those institutions stand on indigenous land. Those of us in Europe work in institutions that have directly or indirectly benefited from settler colonialism and this should be acknowledged too. As part of our effort to support indigenous leadership and activism, the organizing committee has chosen to, to donate to the Warrior Women Project, which you can find linked on our website. We ask that attendees consider contributing to this project or other indigenous or organization of your choice to materially support the project of decolonization. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna hand over now to Melina and Krista to start, uh, yeah, 
for leading the way. Thank you so much, firstly, both of you, for putting this um, session together. I'm really looking forward to see how it goes and what you have planned for us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share Anna. my screen so that you all can see our slides. We won't leave the slides up the whole time, I'm not wanting to marginalize all the pictures off to the side, but uh, for a little bit of orientation. There we go. So uh, we we uh, wanted to um, to begin also with a late acknowledgement. I'm going to um, be here expressing gratitude, in particular, um, from the Seattle area um, and uh, for the Coast Salish people, who are the original stewards of the Puget Sound lands, where I'm speaking to you to from today, the Puyallup, the Duwamish, the Squamish, the Tulalip, and the Muckleshoot nations. And I am Krista Olson, and I am speaking to you from Ho-Chunk land uh, and at, from a university that employs me and that would not be what it is without land that was um, expropriated and then sold to fund the university through the Morrill Act um, of the Chippewa and the Menominee people as well. So, oh, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, we're, uh, oh, it's, it is it is Friday afternoon. It's Friday um, at 3 a.m. for people in London. I'm just kidding, I'm make, but I know it's late for y'all. Um, and uh, it's been a long week of Zooms. Uh, we really appreciate you all coming here and spending some time with us. We're hoping that this session today is going to um, feel um, energizing and, um, and not depleting. We realized that the title of it is labor, which sounds the opposite of what we're hoping for the, we're hoping the sentiment actually will be to you know, infuse you with energy. Um, and it will be interactive. Um, Chris is gonna tell you that the structure of it in just a minute. And be so before we actually enter into the structure, we wanted to talk about just some basic community agreements or norms um, that, that we have for today. The first one, uh, these come from, I should say, from the project that I work on uh, at my center, which is called um, Interrupting Privilege. Um, and you can, you can search that if you're interested or I can share some more with you. But uh, the first one is to listen, to understand and not to argue, to really work to hear people, um, especially if uh, what they're saying makes you uncomfortable, the third norm here, um, to stick with it, um, to ask clarifying questions when you have that time in your breakout rooms, as opposed to trying to spend your time on breaking down somebody's argument or, or ideas rather. Um, the second piece is speaking your truth. Um, that means that especially for those of us who are minoritized, we do not have to hold or represent all of our people here. It's a big burden as we know. And that means for other people, as you are hearing folks, particularly those who are minoritized, that you are not expecting them to represent all of their people, whoever you um, kind of identify their people as. And intersectionally, that means lots of different things. The third one is working hard to stay engaged, um, especially uh, when you're hitting points of discomfort. Um, the fourth one is trying to call people into the conversation instead of calling them out. It doesn't mean muting anger. It means trying to just be a, having a productive conversation um, that, that um, uh, is expanding limits of, um, of where most of us usually end conversations on, um, on equity issues issues. And um, if possible, when you share with us, if you feel comfortable and you can pop your camera on, it's nice to be able to talk to, um, to a human and to engage in that way. If you're able to, um, not necessarily right now when we're presenting, but when we're actually talking, that would be terrific. But if you can't, we totally get that as well. Yeah. Uh, and with that, um, please uh, add into the chat if there's anything else um, in particular, and then we can kind of continue this as we move into our sessions, if there's anything else that you would like to, um, to include in these community agreements. Really need you want me to wait a second for folks to add? Yeah, I'll wait a second to see if you want to put anything in the chat. And we can, as we move into the, the, the session, I'll, I'll prompt this again. 
Um, so, and we'll keep an eye on that as well. And Automate, you can, you can please let us know if someone else puts something in there. All right, then you can move on. Excellent. Oh, there we are. So um, I have the, the job of sort of telling us what I think, what we think we're going to do. We're going to spend these first 20 minutes um, giving you some opening frames and ideas. Uh, Relina is a true expert in this area. And I would say that I'm more somebody who has been working in this area and trying to make up my way forward in it. Um, so framing, but not the ultimate word on these issues, perhaps. And then we want to give people time to talk together about the three themes that we're going to be putting before you the idea of making spaces of addressing policies and then being able to keep doing this work and, and even find joy in doing the work um, and so we're going to go to those breakout rooms we'll come back to share what we've heard and, sh and talked about we'll go back into breakout rooms and then again share and then and then wrap up um, we have two hours. We are thinking about 90 minutes. It is Friday afternoon. Uh, and so we hope that we can have 90 really productive minutes and, and then go on together. Um, and so there's, there's our structure. Uh, if you want to make sure we cover something, please feel free to drop it in the chat so we can come back to things. Um, but from here, we'll get going on our, on our three th pieces, our three frames. Excellent. Um, so, so we we have these three frames here that that um, that Chris just showed you that, that we're going to take us through, and so um, everyone who's here is um, somehow invested. We saw as people were, were introducing themselves, um, somehow invested in in the process of change making at their institution, right? And this might be through um, being a member of a diversity committee. Um, or it might be through, you know, part of your actual named position. And so what I was going to do is kind of name um, the different types of spaces for change that I've been a part of in my um, 16 years post graduate school. And, um, and I put them in these three kind of categories here, the ghost spaces, kind of interventionist spaces, and, and now um, as an administrator um, and a part of the institution. Um, and I'm going to take this fairly quickly through this. So to tell you a little bit about me, I've been at the University of Washington, Seattle for um, my entire career from assistant through full professor. Uh, and as I arrived there in 2005, I was part of a group of scholars um, who we were the first ones who were there to diversify our units in terms of body, in terms of scholarship, um, and in terms of um, curriculum. And many of us, uh, most of us did not have mentors. And so at that moment, we were really looking across the university, uh, even though I was the only one hired in my, in my department in the communication department, there were other folks across campus um, who were similarly positioned. And really it was a lot of women of color in particular who were, who were um, hired at that time. So um, we found each other and we created what we're calling here this ghost space, uh, this women of color faculty group. Um, this here that I've included is probably the only official mention of our organization wired women investigating race, ethnicity and difference that you'll be able to find on the web. Although now I'm very feeling very self-conscious realizing this is, this is going to be living in perpetuity um, on, in tape as well. But so why we began as this small group of people kind of meeting at each other's houses, um, clinging to each other with the hopes that we would someday get tenure, trying to share with each other these, these um, unofficial scripts that were never shared with us in, in many spaces. And um, we had this really interesting uh, relationship with the institution where we would ask them, we asked them for support but we understood and they and they gave us some limited support we understood that that support from them was contingent upon them owning us and so we chose to maintain this kind of ghost status right where uh we did not become incorporated and that has been how wired has functioned uh in this kind of shell way where uh the administration uses wired sometimes to try and recruit uh, faculty members 
and we're like, who, who are you talking about? And but we'll, we'll, we now have 70 something members. We have, we're a tri campus um, that are all within driving distance. So um, University of Washington, Seattle, um, Tacoma, and Bothell. Um, but but for, for a wide variety of reasons, uh, as we are offering um, tenure workshops for women of color, as we're offering writing retreats, as we're offering reading groups and all these different structures of mentoring um, uh, as we, we do baby showers, right? All these different things that really are about the process of creating belonging. Um, we also were, were just really uh, cautious about that, that, that incorporation. So that was kind of the first thing. The second piece for me, the second type of an intervention in terms of structural uh, change, and I'm thinking about what Dr. Washington said in the last session about the impossibility of, of institutional change. Um, so of at least of individuals making their way through successfully, right? Uh, we've had very few tenure denials and, and very few people actually have left the university, a very few women of color because of it. I think it's, it, it has been due um, in, in large part to the support structure. The interventionist center here, um, in this department where I was, it felt like in the communication department that um, while people were very eager for me to create different things, um, it was still rather siloed, right? And at that moment, um, I was able to garner some resources and think about what the community was asking for. And at that moment, this was in 2014. So um, Trayvon Martin was, was murdered in 2012, 2014, Mike Brown was murdered. We had, uh, we had the Ferguson uprisings and we started doing these teach-ins and bringing groups of people together uh, in order to talk about, um, about change and to talk about how communication and communication and race and communication scholarship can sit at the center. And at that moment, I thought, you know what? There's one thing for me to be able to bring people together to host wonderful events. There's another thing to leave an imprint and actually to have the institution have to um, take some type of responsibility. And so that was about the founding of the center, um, thinking about all the work that I, I had done curricularly in terms of um, research, in terms of um, community building, right? And partnering that with everything else. So you can see here, this is a picture from our founding. That's the um, incredible Herman Gray at the center who was uh, one of our keynote speakers there um, and a number of our faculty um, and some of our alumni that we brought back for the center. And this, this, this interrupting privilege program I, I mentioned, um, which is a community gauged program is really at the center of what And she asked me for six months if I would diversity. I'm like, are you, are you who I am? Are you really asking this? And she was like, no, I think we could do something different here. I think this is going to be a different process. So I talked to all of my, this is the time to try it. And so I did. Um, I, I renamed it, refocused it, um, and we had it to new. Is it? Is, uh, on equity and graduate programs, but to like diversity. Like my aim in concert with the entire graduate school is that while I'm responsible for thinking about graduate programs and bringing equity and justice to graduate programs and having conversations with all the different entities throughout the graduate school, I'm doing this in partnership with everybody. I'm doing this in partnership with my data people, but actually you all are responsible for all of the, the idea data issues, right? The people that do um, all the different things that, that pertain to graduate students have to hold and be responsible for this own, and it doesn't end with me. So, so these are three of the ways in which um, Chris and I were talking about one can think about creating different spaces for change and that you'll have an opportunity to think about um, in one of the breakout rooms in particular. All right, I'm passing the mic over to you now, Krista. 
for some reason I have to wave my cursor around for a while to get my unmute back. All right. So we also talked, and this, I think this part two touches on a lot of what the previous session uh, was really calling out as risky, problematic work, right? This is, this is the work of uh, trying to create changes at institutions that don't want to be changed, institutions that are, that are never going to be anti-racist, as, as Professor Washington said. Um, and so then, you know, I want to start our, our conversation here with the, the why do this? If we, if we know that at some level it'll never be enough, it'll always be co-opted, um, why try to change policies at the institutional level? And I come to this, first of all, as a white person uh, doing this work. Um, and so perhaps as somebody who has an easier time forgetting that the institution won't change um, and an easier time thinking that it can be okay. Uh, and so I, I'm constantly having to check myself on that doing this work. I also come to it though, as a sort of production manager style person. Before I went back to grad school, I worked in the theater and in dance theater as the production manager. And if you know anything about theater, um, the production manager is the person who's behind the scenes trying to make the systems work for people who are on stage and who are gonna eventually be the headliners for things. And so um, I'm a person who's inclined to build structures and systems and to make them work and to figure out how to help the people who are gonna be on the front have the best experience they can so that people who are encountering them can also have a wonderful experience. Um, so I've brought that impulse into my academic work, uh, never quite left the production manager role. So I've been doing that in my own department. I've been doing it with the Rhetoric Society of America and with the American Society for the History of Rhetoric a bit. Um, I think it's worth noting that I have not done a lot of that at the full institution level. And I think it can be a lot easier to make these kinds of changes at small scholarly organizations or in a single department than to tackle the large institution. And so I want to acknowledge that that's something that um, is still on the horizon for me. Um, but I want to go back to this question of why do it? And I think for me, it gets to what um, Professor Washington and Professor Self said about what do you do for the people who are there? There are going to be students in minoritized positions. There are going to be grad students and staff and faculty, all of whom um, are going to be negatively affected by this institution. And what do we do to reduce harm? This, I, I see this as a harm reduction situation. Um, so, and I want to point out that policy work is not a new committee and it is not the writing of a statement. Um, it is instead figuring out where our spheres of influence are and then uh, acting to make change in policy within those spheres of influence. Um, and so I wanna talk about, first of all, the a calculation that I think is really important to make, which is which policies in my institutions are doing harm? Plus, which policies can we feasibly change right now? Plus, which changes will make a real difference for people who are harmed? Um, and then where's my sphere of influence? So where can I do that? And paying attention to that doesn't mean saying you don't try for the, the bigger ticket items, but it means that you can start to make those changes and then work outward from them once you've set up a difference. So um, as an example, with the Rhetoric Society of America, um, we, my colleague Lisa Flores uh, referred to what we were doing as low hanging fruit. We made, we are making major changes in the structure of our awards. We, we noticed that uh, the RSA awards were disproportionately uh, going to white people, to men, to able-bodied people, to uh, uh, straight people. We noticed just a consistent problem. And we talked about all kinds of approaches and we decided we needed to change them from the bottom up and change the policy so that they, so that everyone sort of, like what Professor Joseph said, everyone was responsible for equity. Everybody was responsible for access, not a special award that awards people who have been left out of the rest of the awards. Um, and we changed those awards, not because changing our award system changes the institution, 
not because changing the award system creates an anti-racist future for RSA, but because if we can't change the awards, then we can't change the bigger structures either. We have to show, we have to build the sense of that the low hanging fruit will be taken care of and we will, take, we will get rid of it. Um, so that's kind of where I've ended up doing up sort of the practical approach of what can I change immediately and then where can I go from there? Um, another piece that I just wanna make sure is in, on our radar as we think about changing policy is um, the importance not only of changing policy, but of creating buy-in for those changes. Um, I'm working right now on an inclusive excellence task force in our department that's thinking specifically about pedagogy. We'll eventually be thinking about how we change our evaluations. But right now we're thinking about how do we even recognize and, award, and reward the fact that excellent pedagogy requires attention to inclusive, inclusiveness and equity. Um, and I had a few moments when I was charging forward in the changing of policy and then had somebody stop who, who had, had been saying, yeah, yes, I'm all about inclusion, I'm all about equity, I'm all about this idea, and then said, wait, no, you don't think what I do in my class is appropriately inclusive. So then your definition of what inclusive it is needs to change. And while I was not willing to change the definition of what inclusive meant in that moment, um, I did need to bring that person along. Because if you change a policy, but nobody in the room agrees with the policy that you made, that policy is just going to get dropped or ignored. And so how do you bring people into that work has become an, another really important piece for me so that th those, those changes really matter. Um, so those are my, that's my, my overview of, of changing policies. I really want to especially focus on this, um, the question that came up in the session earlier about you know, essentially what can white people do? And that, that response of see the obvious issues and then respond to those obvious issues, um, that calculation of where, what, what can I influence? Where can I make change? What do I know is causing harm? And then circling the, root, the roots of that is for me the, the root of why we change policies and how we do it. I need the mic over now. Will I make myself on mute, mute myself? Excellent. Um, and and th this is this is really tremendous. I think that the 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 contours of of how we have our um, allies, our accomplices, step into this work are incredibly complicated. Right, and we need to actually be talking to each other and to be in partnership with each other um, for it to happen. Uh, and so I think that this is this is uh, although I'm I am a, I'm a huge proponent of white folks going off and having their own conversations and doing this really um, this intensive work together. We do need to also figure out how we can articulate what um, what how people of color are feeling and what our limits are in this space as well. Um, so this is about the, the sustained, the sustenance um, piece. And we started to talk about this. This is my, this is a question that I posed um, that I was hoping y'all would answer because uh, I don't know the answer of it. Um, what do we, what can we do um, that is going to not just combat our, um, our exhaustion, our racial exhaustion at this moment, but how do we actually foster joy in the process. And so we heard a little bit from the last um, the, the last uh, panel, um, Francesca was talking really about the importance of, um, of, of, of coalitions, of friendships, of having these other spaces. Um, uh, Myra was talking about seeing also the, the kind of marathon uh, that we're doing at this moment, as opposed to um, seeing it as constantly as a sprint. Um, there are, uh, we've had, I, I know if you all have heard leaders talking about careers as being a series of sprints. Um, I think that that's, I, I, I like that in certain ways, except for the fact that you need to figure out how do you put rest in the middle of that, right? And that was something that the franchise was also talking about was, was rest. Um, I think that this is this is part of what what we are all struggling with right now, and and I have yet to to come to um, to come to the answer. This is the this is the question that 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 I'm chasing. Uh, so my center, I told you all that 
that we are doing, we do this program that's on interrupting privilege. It's a, it's a racial dialoguing program, um, a, a one that works out in the community as well as on the university's campus. It's intergenerational. Um, we've had both intraracial and interracial versions of it. And um, it does really important work and people are really exhausted who are doing it. And so we've been partnering with um, the University of Washington's Resilience Lab to see if there are actually strategies that they use that we can import in. And we're, gonna, we're, we're working on this, we're trying to work on this, we're trying to create this new program that's on combating racial exhaustion. Um, but until then, I, um, I would love to see what people actually in the breakout rooms are going to come up with here. Cause I think we need, um, we need just lots of um, lots of different of different strategies, day-to-day um, -day strategies. Um, I'm, I really want more strategies that are happening in the workplace. I heard lots of strategies that are happening outside of the workplace. I want more things that are happening actually in the workplace as well. Krista, did you want to add to this? Well, I was just going to say that I think sort of in. You opened this talking about the, the intra intraracial as well as interracial. Um, and I think for me, the conversation, and I'm happy to, to be somebody who takes this conversation, um, maybe like we're talking to each other and dealing with our own our own shit. Um, oh crap, I was the first one to start on the, on the recording. Uh, so dealing with our stuff, that kind of where do how do we deal with our stuff so that we don't add to that burden? So the 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 fostering of joy doesn't get interrupted by the nonsense of white folks. Um, and you know the the reality is that each of us will occasionally bring our nonsense into spaces where it does not belong. Um, and so the other piece that I think is so important in this with accountability is to have those relationships of accountability before disaster strikes or before the the nonsense happens, um, rather than waiting until something goes wrong, to find out who could hold you accountable. So I think that's one of the ways that white people decrease joy for our colleagues is by waiting until there's a problem to try to address it. Yeah. I'm gonna go out of screen sharing because I think we're at the end Perfect. of our- Perfect, yes. All right. Um, so that was our, that's our general setup now. And we're going to now give you all the opportunity to spend some time in breakout rooms talking about those, those general three topics that, that we just discussed there. Um, the first one, um, well, we might, we might need it up again though, Chris, I'm <laughs> realizing. I was just gonna um, say, I just put the, um, a link to the slideshow. Oh, perfect. In okay. the chat. So you guys can, can click so, on that. Yeah, so if you go there, well, if you go there, you should be able to see um, the slides. These the, the questions for each group are uh, number eight, nine, and ten for the three the three breakout groups. And here, let me open the rooms. What I've done? Oh shoot! <sighs> Zoom kindly deleted my pre-named section, so I'm oh, going no. to. That's all right. I'm just going to put, we got it. We I'm going to open the rooms. Um, I'm just going to I'm just I'm just going to pause the recording now while you work out all the breakout room stuff. Is that okay? That's great. We don't yeah, we don't need this for posterity's sake. All right. Go. So we're coming right. back after our breakout rooms. I'm going to post in the chat our three questions rather than pulling up our um, screen again. So we wanted you to to share back questions that linger for you. Um, things that emerged from your conversation that surprised or challenged you um, and advice or insights that you want to bring back with you to your, your inst institutional contexts. Um, any answers to those thoughts about them? Things you want us to think about in the group? I have one. Please. Um, I'm at a new institution, so I've been thinking a lot about like who I can trust. And one of the things I've noticed about academic conferences is that they can be these really great places where um, you go to the conference and there's all these people and you get excited about ideas and you're going out um, maybe drinking or maybe just eating and there's a lot of like intense social activities. 
which, um, so I'm at a new institution and I don't really know who to trust in my new institution, but I'm thinking also about this issue in, in the discipline and how like you think you can trust people because you've built these relationships in these like faux social environments that are super intense and then and then it doesn't work out or it does work out. And um, I'm just, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I mentioned this to the group and we talked about it very briefly, but I'm very interested in thinking about how we come to trust people and who the allies are and, um, you know, how do we find those mentors? Well, I'm more of a senior person, but, um, uh, you know, how do we shape uh, trust and relationship mm -hmm. building with our mm -hmm. colleagues? at mm -hmm. our institutions and in the mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you for that, Stacy. And I mean, uh, uh, immediately, and I have one of my, I should say, my Michelle is one of my advisees um, who, who is here. And thinking about um, uh, trust and connection being contingent upon um, socializing uh, makes me also pretty nervous, right? In, in terms of thinking about so um, what does this mean in terms of um, gender? What does this mean in terms of also expectations of, of is, is Michelle gonna have to go out and, and, and pay for her, or for her drinks for an expensive you know, evening out at a conference? I mean, I think that there, there are so many, we were talking a lot of, we were talking about power in our, in our group, um, but um, we, we wanna create spaces where people are able to connect at, at conferences or whatever, whatever the, the spaces are, but we also want to be really attentive to um, to ways that are that are made equitable for everyone to engage in the same way, right? And um, and I think about that for for our graduate students, for postdocs, junior faculty, for our teaching faculty, our contingent faculty, um, because it's gonna it's gonna look different in, in all different types of ways. I don't know if other people talked about, about some similar things. I was gonna say, and this is a moment when I'm at risk of being an institution person, but thinking especially about professional organizations and the ways that insurgent spaces in professional organizations can, you can't create, an institution can't create trust, but it can possibly invest in opening spaces within the institution that don't rely on people spending money beyond the cost of attending the event, um, but can give people a chance to meet people they could trust. So I'm thinking about uh, at the Rhetoric Society of America, the Research Network Forum that has in recent years been hmm, getting slightly better at who the people who are headlining that are. So that people can seek out a safe space and collaborations. And similarly, like various conferences that have shifted to a more workshop model that make the potential for that to happen. I think those spaces could be used, it could be used really intentionally as insurgent spaces, even though it's not perfect. Yeah. Anjali? Yeah, I was just gonna say that, um... I think that there is just no substitute for time and no substitute for um, pacing, you know, like getting to know people over time. Um, I am sort of a like hang back and, um, you know, figure out the lay of the land before I get involved sort of person. And, and one of the things that I think is really difficult about this kind of work is that you're asked to do it immediately by virtue of the body that you are inhabiting, right? And so, um, I think that's really unfair to scholars of color. And I think we are asked to like have immediate trust and intimacy with people. Um, and that's that's going to blow up because because of the kinds of social spaces that you're talking about, you know, and so I just for me, I try to, as a personal intervention, say to myself, is this moving faster than I'm able? Like, do I have, like, just to check in with myself often and say, am I at a level of trust where I feel good about sharing this information? Or um, do I, you know, do I need to set a boundary here? Or do I need to take a step back, right? And so I have, I mean, when we talk about doing the personal work, that's one of the things that I have learned that I have to be much more aware of where my discomfort is and when it is with respect to trust because you know trauma brings trust issues and 
Um, also, it's a professional space. So like, this is how we, we feed people around us, right? Like our families and ourselves and all of that. So it matters, the stakes are high. So I think that would, that's what I would say, you know, checking in with yourself, thinking really intentionally about creating intimacy and what it means and um, making deliberate choices. Um, my my question um, is kind of uh, thinking of the conversations that uh, my group, uh, Stacy, Jennifer, and and Amanda, that we had, which is um, the and Stacy kind of alluded to it or directly mentioned it when she talked about conferences and these social spaces. And I found that one thing I struggle with is that I am fortunate to have a good group of friends um, across uh, institutions, and um, so when we have our moments of success, whether that's a publication, um, a new job, a presentation, whatever it might be, um, there tends to be lots of positive support, like, hey, congratulations on this. Um, within my department, however, it's as if no one knows I've done anything. And so I'm faced with a, a situation where because um, none of my colleagues who are very kind people, um, uh, um, I'm fortunate for that, but none of them remotely work in my area, it's as if the journals I publish in are invisible, even though they're like, I'm fortunate to publish in NCA journals. Um, th these, these are spaces that should be visible by all standards of the field, but, but they're, in, they're not. And so I'm faced with a situation where I'm either the guy who, or person who's always arrogant being like, look what I did last week, look what I did. But it's because if I don't, no one knows or being silent and um, all this stuff being done is, is never recognized. And so I don't know for uh, those who are part of the, this group, how they navigate that sense of, it, it feels weird to be like self-promotion because it's no one else will. And that's so critical for, you know, tenure, so critical for, for all these things. So I just don't know what advice anyone has or if that's how other people manage. Yeah, that's, 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 it's a, that's really hard. Um, I, I did a, I ran an, an equity summit this week um, for my job at the graduate school. And one of the panels was on um, cross-racial mentorship because what, what you need is a mentor here to do this, Robert. And we had this wonderful postdoc um, who said, who gave the model and said that, uh, you know, he had heard, I forget what the citation was, that, that mentors, either you have mentors who come in the form of a champion so the one who will share when when you need someone to really kind of you know fly that flag and you know Robert this amazing thing and I want to share with everyone or um, you're applying for this job and you need someone to really like speak on your behalf or to help you figure out the tenure all the different things um, and then you need also a coach someone who's in there day to day and it's like you got this here are some strategies uh, you need to work harder on this piece you need to let up over here um, and then you also need need some kind of combination of the two day to day. Um, so in, in, you know, many of us are not necessarily lucky enough to have that within our department, but we might be able to have them. It sounds like you have them with your group of friends um, across, across areas, which, and you might be able to have them across the, the institution as well. Um, so thinking about, you know, maybe what you need is a different kind of a mentor who can be, um, play that champion role sometimes and, and um, maybe share something with the chair who then the chair can then share something out. I also think here about the value of structures that um, I don't know how you cultivate a chair to do this necessarily, but if you, if you create a structure where your chair has a weekly or a monthly email that they send and you and the, the culture becomes that people send the chair things that they need to be congratulated for. And then the chair can send those things out. That, so it, like, this depends on all sorts of things, like having a good chair, having somebody who's willing to do this, right? But cultivating those kinds of structures where then it's a norm in the department that you would send that makes it easier then to do it 
within the frame of your of your department and and like i said that depends on having a chair who's willing to do it but if you've got somebody there you can then create once one person does it it creates an expectation that the chair will do it in perpetuity and that's a, a benefit so it's like can you can you build that in as a habit I think that's a great strategy when um, you don't have jealousy problems in your department, but I think it relates to another question. I mean, a constant sort of question I have, and we, we can take this up or not. I don't, I don't want to take up too much space here, but um, I think that this is also work of constantly negotiating jealousy, right? If you're productive and if other people are not and what that, how, how that sort of work, I think this is related to what Robert was saying, reads to other people in your department. Um, because we all know the maxim that, you know, faculty of color do double the work, or particularly women of color, right? And um, advertising that is also <laughs> creates problems in, in some contexts, right? So I think it's complicated. Yes. And you're awesome. Anjali was also my student, was also my advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, yeah, that's, that's the reality and like haters gonna hate. I mean, I think that, that, that really when it comes down to it, I feel like, I feel like we're probably going to have some knowledge that she's about to drop right here, that, that, um, yes, you are more productive and that's a good thing. And you should never apologize for that ever. Right. Um, and you should be very, I, I think that, 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 uh, <laughs> Uh, it was Myra in the last session who said, "Don't give love to people who don't give love back to you," but um, but she she cursed. I won't. I'll try. I'm gonna try not to curse on the on on the recording. Uh, but but to be very clear, as you're reading, I think this is the slow pacing that you were also naming, Anjali. Um, the 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 who who are actually your 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 friends and supporters in the spaces um, as you are sharing out what your productivity looks like and all the exciting things that you're doing. Um, because you're right that this absolutely can be used against you, right? All of the wonderful work that you're doing can actually be used against you. And so you have to figure out, um, this is all the ways in which we're not able to step into the room and just be ourselves. Um, we have to figure out how to negotiate that. Um, but, but certainly, certainly never apologize for any of your incredible and amazing work, right? Um, and I think that like part of what I do, um, so I've experienced this quite a bit, is, is I try and the script that I try and have for myself is that when that comes at me, it's because of the way in which the institution has shaped that person, right? And um, so that it's not, it's never about me, it's about what I represent here in this moment. And that helps to give me some peace. Um, that that you know they're not they're not really there all all of the hatred the anger that they're 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 throwing at me is not actually about me right it's about their um being really burned by the institution and it's coming out in this way rupali what do you have to say you have you have something i know you do i was i was actually doing a little chat for robert uh but i guess i can share it more widely um I totally hear Anjali's point about uh, needing to monitor um, how much, um, you know, of the sort of self brand you put out there in the department because there's a lot of department across department sort of jealousy and so this is not a solution to the problem but long time ago I decided I was okay with being much more famous outside my department than I was inside my department. Um, and, um, you know, I know for a fact that on occasion, you know, when I've gone up from one promotion to another, that there's been a kind of um, surprise among my colleagues uh, from sort of some of the praise that has come for me because, oh, they didn't know that I was, you know, sort of accomplished in some ways. And, you know, on the one hand, it's a shame that they can't hear this and know this and be okay with this. On the other hand, um, I'm, I'm wary of the kind of danger that Anjali articulated. You know, I'd really rather not have you uh, walk around super defensive and resentful of me because, you know, more people love me 
than they do you or your work. It's really not about personality. It's about like how useful the work is and maybe, you know, whatever. So um, it's a tough line. And uh, my solution was to not worry about the department. Yeah, I, I think that that's a that's a, a really really wise protective mechanism. I mean, I was a yeah. I was a research, I was a research fellow in onomics department a few years ago, and all kinds of people at Goldsmiths knew me. Uh, you know, I mean, it was wonderful to be there. They were very hospitable to me. Uh, but often I would be like, you know, if you were to listen to any of my colleagues, they would be astonished. <laughs> Rupali is a superstar at Goldsmiths. I do, can't imagine it being any different anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, she is a superstar. Okay, stop. Period. <laughs> any other um, any other questions, lingering questions, comments, things, people? Yeah, probably, please. Um, I wanted to just note that we had a wonderful conversation in our group having to do, and Lynn brought this up, um, about the actual mechanics given exhaustion, given exposure, given that we have a lot of work to do, um, about the usefulness and the logistics of these ghost spaces. And as that conversation was going on in our group, I was thinking that, you know, um, the idea of ghost spaces essentially opens up for me the sort of radical variety in which these spaces might exist. And so, you know, if people are, you know, similar as with Lynn and with me interested in this idea of ghost spaces, what are these spaces and how, you know, how can they be useful for survival, for flourishing, for all of the things that this conference has been about? But anyways, I just wanted to note that the concept of ghost spaces gave us a lovely conversation in the group. Um, I'm wary that we're coming up to 90 minutes, I've gone past 90 minutes. So Krista and Melina, is there anything you wanna finish up on? We actually had a last slide, should I pull it up? So we have our- yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, is there, before we do that, is there, I don't want to um, to stop before, is there anybody else that wanted to bring anything um, to the floor? Any other questions or comments before we head into the last slide? I'd love to add what we were talking about because I'd love to hear what you and, um, and Krista have to say about it. We were talking about money. We were talking about budgets, right? Uh, so um, I am I'm a firm believer that there is always money just a question of who there's money for and who's there's who doesn't have access to that money. So I was just hoping that we could maybe touch on that a little bit, how, um, what sorts of strategies folks could develop to find money, um, or what that looks like, what it, how you can produce leverage in different institutional spaces around, you know, budgets and money and so on. Can I ask yeah. Angelie and Robert and any other conference organizer here how you got money for this conference? That's a starting point. Good job, by the way. Great. <laughs> Anjali, if you want to start. Sure. Um, we, I mean, we did a lot of grant work. I will say that, you know, working at a private institution means that um, I, I work at a resource rich institution. And so um, I, I try to use that, you know. Um, so that's one thing. Um, we also, I mean, we had co-organizers, I think, that that sort of share that and had some access to um, different spaces, uh, grants, etc. cetera, um, and, and professional organizations as well, right? So NCA, ICA, all of our co-sponsors, um, you know, we talked. We talked about this. We talked about like where does money come from? Who has money? You know, do we believe it them when they say they don't have money? <laughs> How hard do we want to push? Right. Like also joining a bunch of people together creates leverage. So one of the reasons um, 
I think that it's effective to have co-organizers is it's a lot harder to say no to a group of people that have um, strong institutional affiliations, right? Than it is uh, to say no to one person uh, in behind closed doors. So I think that making it costly to say no is helpful and also knowing which institutions have um, money to invest in which ones um, are going to be more difficult uh, in terms of resources. What I would add is, um, is one, um, like Anjali said, uh, there is money out there. Um, I'm pessimistic in that it may not be super abundant, but it does exist. And so for um, me, the contribution was uh, through the NCA Advancing the Discipline Grant, which I would encourage everybody to consider. Every year, it's, I think, up to $5,000. Um, they might give out multiple awards. So if you have a project, NCA has a small pot of money. Another, it, we didn't apply for it for this. And um, I will say this on the record because I, I find it upsetting, but we were denied one grant because they felt that our project was going to be successful. And so I felt like it kind of made no sense that that was why we were denied funding. Um, and so there is a, a funding available. Um, and and so uh, Waterhouse uh, Family Institute, shame on you for that. Um, but that's a, a organization that does fund good work. I think that it was problematic for them to deny funding for this. Um, and then another source, and they fund more, so they'll fund up to $10,000 typically, and so they're an annual um, uh, resource that you can consider. And then we're in the midst of a pandemic, and so I reached out to my department and said, I'm not traveling anywhere this year. Can we redirect my travel funds to support this conference? And so um, that's where we got some additional funding from. Um, the last thing I'll say, uh, really wanted to keep in mind that uh, Krista and uh, Relina have a lot of really valuable stuff to say near the end, is um, I am not a good organizer by any stretch of the imagination, but I've been able to successfully organize. And the reason why I mentioned that is if you have ideas, if you have things you wanna accomplish, um, do it, uh, reach out to people, share your ideas, Anjali um, has been a rock for this group. I'm sure Anna Mick, you, you would echo that. Um, but these, these ideas have come from a year long conversation and we all made um, big and small contributions. And with everything I, I did um, a few years ago for NCA, I, I organized um, uh, a pre-conference on communication and the politics of survival. I had no idea what I was doing. I just asked people if they wanted to participate and people said yes. And then I was like, oh God, I've got to figure out how to make this happen. And so my point is, is like, um, if you have ideas, you're all as smart, if not significantly smarter and more capable than I am. And so if, if I'm able to pull off something, um, just work with Anjali and it will happen. So that's, that's my advice. <laughs> I would second that. I would second that. Absolutely true, that. right? Um, I just want to <laughs> add, um, I was, I, I, I'm on an editorial board at an academic journal and was able to get funds from them very generously. But academic, let's face it, if you know, we're chasing the money, where's a lot of money to be had? It's with academic publishers, people who publish these journals and so mm. on. So I wonder if we could put more pressure on those. Um, so far, we've talked mostly about institution, our own institutions and professional organizations, but mm. I wonder if academic publishers actually should, because, you know, that's, it's, it's, um, it's kind of interesting <laughs> they make money. Mm -hmm. And, and that, mm -hmm. to be fair to them, a lot of people within these um, publishers are kind of, open, you know, kind of understand they need to do better. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, so that's might be a source of income that I think can be accessed with a bit of a, mm -hmm bit of a push. Yeah, these are all these are all terrific and coming together. The only thing that I would add is that um, when people are, are negotiating, um, particularly uh, for, you know, for, for, for entering into an institution, uh, Anjali is the best negotiator, by the way, um, but entering into an institution or negotiating a retention offer, oftentimes people are just thinking about themselves, right, and what they can do, but thinking about um, all the other places where funds can go. So that's one of the things that we did with WIRED, with our Women of Color faculty group. Every time one of us got a retention, 
And that was a lot of us because um, women of color in academia and um, we're awesome. And we, we, we negotiated for, um, for our writing retreat. So we had this big bank for the writing retreat. So every time that was just kind of, and that was a, in addition to something else and the and they were waiting for us to do that. So they were kind of putting aside, they're like, well, we can't just give you all money, but we know that you're gonna, someone's gonna get uh, another retention offer and you're gonna ask for this. And then um, the University of Washington has a retreat facility that's beautiful. And so the money would just kind of go streaming there. So that was one of the ways. Um, so, but thinking about in those moments, asking for the world, right? And I think a lot of times, um, especially uh, new assistant professors think that, that, that they're not allowed to do that. I think that um, people, you know, are, are really um, shy about asking for things, especially there's a cap, there's always a cap on salary, people seem to want more money, but there's a wide variety of other things that you can look at um, for funding and support uh, at those moments. I'm happy to talk to anybody about negotiations, but I want to echo what Rolina was saying. Uh, we tend to have, as people of color, a limited idea about what asking for the world means. I mean, I, if I were to tell you the stories about what, what white dudes ask for in negotiations, I think many of you would be shocked. Um, but, you know, just like, I think thinking broadly about what that involves, um, I love the writing retreat idea. Um, I know people who have leveraged retention offers for whole hires um, and money and resources, all sorts of stuff. So the retention offer is really, it's powerful and it is a massive amount of leverage if your institution likes you at all. So. I do wanna just for once be the, the downer instead of the up person on <laughs> these issues. Just because I recently went through this, I do wanna remind people though that all of the isms are at work in hiring. And sometimes people are punished for asking for reasonable things when somebody who looked more like me can ask for unreasonable things and not be punished. And so having just had a graduate student who lost an offer um, for asking for very reasonable things, I wanna just make sure that we have some caution in the room about asking for things. And maybe it's easier at retention than it is at the initial hire. Yeah, I think that's a, that's that's a that's a really good point to make, and that part of what you know, um, I think there's a there's an art to it, um, and so you know you're not just asking for the world because I'm just asking for it. You're 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 having justifications all the way through about why this is necessary, um, and and in you know why this is necessary for both for your productivity, why this is in alignment with the with the mission and vision of the department. You're holding this up as an ideal, so so this is very much in alignment here. So you want to be able to tie everything, got your spreadsheets together. You're not just asking, right? But I think that's a great point, Krista. Yeah. Anybody else as we um, we move to our close here? Any other questions or, or comments? All right, take it away, Krista. So this is the opposite of what Myra said to close out the last session. We wanted to end with, with some, some hope here um, and thinking about the, this, the individual, the structural, we are at, a, we know that, that changing institutions is, um, is like uh, trying to move an iceberg, right? Um, and yet, if we are all working together, we, we can be, um, I have to, and now I have to stick with the metaphor. We have to be kind of chipping away at it. Do something better. You're a rhetorician. Do something better for me, Krista. Well, I think in some ways this isn't in conflict with the idea that institutions won't, won't become anti-racist. They won't become uh, perfect. That doesn't mean that there can't be ways that you, that we build these change in through our coalitions, through um, transferring labor to people who do have energy to spare. Um, to building support for one another and finding the money that's there to use it for things like this incredible conference that um, Anjali and Anamik and Robert have put together and more have put together um, that there can be those spaces. And I, I can't imagine staying in an institution that I didn't think it could make some difference in. So 
So with that note, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you to uh, Anamek for, um, for moderating us. Um, thank you so much to the conference organizers for bringing us all here today. And thank you to all of you for participating and spending your Friday afternoon or evening with us. Um, we hope you all have wonderful restful weekends. Brilliant. And thank you so much, Relina and Krista, for putting together such a really brilliant, powerful and, and practical workshop. And I know um, I'm going to take a lot out from this and I'm sure uh, all of our participants will as well. So thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, and just to, yeah, just to remind you all, there is another session next week. Um, so uh, please do look it up on the conference website um, for more details on that. Um, but otherwise, just to reiterate what Rolina says, have a great weekend, you all. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stop to see you soon.